Okay, guys, I, I think we're going to get started. Um, so um, thank you, everybody, for, for coming to this. Um, it, for a, a pre-program before the actual session starts, this is great to see such a packed house. Um, so it's, it's my pleasure to try to introduce this uh, session. Um, this, is my, I, this is my co-moderator. Uh, it's uh, Patricia Carascosa. I'll let her introduce herself. And good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm from Argentina, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with Jim uh, moderating this interesting session. Uh, we're going to have seven uh, conferences, uh, and uh, we're going to be able to, to have some questions about the conferences. Uh, our first speaker is... Uh, sure, our first speaker. Um, so we're talking about the top seven advances in cardiac CT in 2019. So after this session, I think we can all skip the rest of the, the conference. Um, the, <laughs> the, the newest technology will be presented to us by Dr. Jeff Carr, who's a past president of the Society of Cardiovascular CT. And this new technology is something called coronary artery calcium scoring in 2018 cholesterol guidelines. <laughs> Jeff? Well, thank you, Jim and Patricia. I'm really excited to be here in Baltimore, SECT 2019. Um, my title was Adoption of Coronary Calcium by the New 2018 Cholesterol Guidelines. And, you know, if, we, if medicine can make things confusing, we do. Uh, uh, many of you may not be aware, but there's a new set of guidelines that came out uh, variously labeled 2018, 2019. I'd like to think that there was a great debate. The circulation uh, cholesterol guidelines are called the 2018 guidelines, and of course they were published in 2019, so we didn't know about them, but they're still called the 2018 guidelines, even though they weren't published till 2019. The primary prevention guidelines are called the 2019 primary prevention guidelines. So it's pretty clear that the Jack editor said, hey, you people in circulation, you're crazy. These are published in 2019, so we should call them 2019 guidelines. And then there's a third article by Donald Lloyd Jones that talks about the risk assessment tools. And what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is take you at a high level through how these work together and how these are really the fulfillment of really decades of research on coronary artery calcium. So the big change from a uh, cholesterol management are these 2018 guidelines, and it's, it's led by a, a committee of all stars. Uh, the first author, Scott Grundy, came out in circulation in 2019. It's a comprehensive look at both primary and secondary prevention for management of cholesterol. Uh, I'm not going to go through all aspects of this comprehensive document. One of the big changes is how we manage statins. We go from a more you know, two-tiered to where we now have high-intensity, moderate, and low-intensity statin management. There's also additions for PKS9 and secondary medications, that address aspirin, addresses a lot of things. Uh, this document has a list of the top 10 take-home message that you can see on the left. Uh, I've circled the 7, 8, and 9, which those are directly applicable to cardiac imaging and the use of the calcium score. And the key take-home message that I think we need to take home from the cholesterol management is that now embedded within the cholesterol guidelines is the ability or, or the recommendation to measure the amount of plaque using the calcium score that, uh, and to quote, when risk is uncertain or if statin therapy is problematic, it can be helpful to measure coronary calcium to refine risk assessment. A CAC score predicts atherosclerotic cardiovascular events in a graded fashion and is independent of other risk factors such as age, sex, and ethnicity. A CAC score equal to zero is useful for reclassifying patients to lower risk groups, often allowing statin therapy to be withheld or postponed until higher risk conditions are present. This is really a, 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 a major shift uh, among epidemiologists and population health that we can now use the CT calcium score to help guide risk assessment. 
Uh, relative to understanding in the primary prevention, I would like to direct your attention to the articles by Donna Arnett and by Donald Lloyd-Jones. These two articles, one is near and dear to my heart because it's guidelines made simple. So it has a lot of diagrams and pictures, and as a radiologist, I like pictures. Uh, it doesn't have quite as many words, and so it's easier to get the top 10. I will say that the top 10 list in this document is different from the top 10 in the other document, so you have to be careful about which top 10 you're talking about. And then Donald Lloyd-Jones' article really drills down on how they made the decision to incorporate the coronary calcium score into it, and we'll review those at a high level. So I think the other big take-home message is that what we, the guidelines from 2013 really started the shift to calculating a patient's 10-year cardiovascular risk by race and ethnicity. The new guidelines in 2018-19, the big take-home message is lifestyle changes across the lifespan, that the primary thing that we can do to reduce cardiovascular risk is to foster healthy life change, lifestyle changes. The second aspect of it is that uh, a team-based strategy to managing patients from really from birth all the way to death to optimize care of cardiovascular medicine. So that's the top two take-homes. And then in number three, for adults 40 to 75 years of age, the 10-year atherosclerotic risk calculation is central to our management of their prevention. And that in everybody in those age ranges, this risk estimate should be uh, calculated using the cohort, uh, the, the pooled cohort risk equation, which has been further uh, tuned, and that uh, that should engender a discussion between the healthcare team and the patient. Now, the key part of that is this last sentence. In addition, assessing for other risk-enhancing factors can help guide decisions about prevention in select individuals, as can the coronary artery calcium scanning. And so there's two new points. There's these what they call risk-enhancing factors and coronary calcium are now central to those people at borderline and intermediate risk. They have a new table that I won't go into detail because of the limited time that we have, but suffice it to say that there are these people at low risk and high risk, those people we know how to manage from a prevention perspective, but for those people in the middle, if the risk decision is uncertain, consider coronary calcium in select adults. Calcium of zero, consider no statins unless diabetes, family history, premature heart disease, or cigarette smoking are present. For one to 99 calcium score, especially after age 55, it favors a statin above 100 statin therapy should be initiated. So very strong recommendations to use the calcium score to help guide statin therapy. I'm gonna just touch on this. These are factors that we know related to either hypercholesterolemia, central obesity, metabolic syndrome, that can help uh, tip the favor toward either going directly to statin therapy or would make the risk estimate uncertain where coronary calcium may be indicated. Uh, the documents talk a lot about the value of a zero calcium score, that the calcium zero score is well demonstrated that if you have zero calcium score, your risk of events is very low. Um, they give examples of how the, the zero calcium score can be helpful, and I think many of us in this room have known this for a long time, but these are now in the document and recommended. Patients reluctant to initiate statins who may wish to understand their risk, calcium score may be indicated. Patients concerned about symptoms related to a statin and had to discontinue a statin and are reluctant to reinstate a different statin, a calcium score may be helpful to manage their risk. Older patients with a low burden of risk factors who may wonder whether they would benefit from statins, coronary calcium score can help modify that risk. And then in early and middle-aged adult, where the risk calculation is in the borderline, coronary calcium can manage. These are all direct quotes uh, from the new prevention guidelines. So a calcium score of 1 to 99 favors statin therapy, especially those 55 years or older. For any patient, if the calcium score is above 100 
or in the 75th percentile, statin therapy is indicated unless otherwise deferred by the outcome of uh, clinician-patient risk discussion. This is the diagram from Donald Lloyd-Jones, and I recommend this article if you are performing coronary calcium. You should look up this article, read it. This is the diagram from that, and it further expands the, the committee, the ACC AHA committee on guidelines thinking about this, but it basically consolidates anybody from the borderline 5 to 7.5 tenure risk or 7.5 to 20 percent that you engage the patient. What, uh, what's their thinking about it? Do they have any of these risk-enhancing features in your clinical decision-making? If you come to a decision where you definitely want to treat with statins, you're over. If there's, uh, they don't want to consider statins, you're done. You can follow the cholesterol guidelines. However, in a vast number of these patients, there's going to be uncertainty about what their true risk is. And that's where the coronary calcium scan is recommended by these guidelines as the only test that can really help stratify patients and further refine their risk. Uh, I think for most people, it's going to be straightforward understanding what a zero calcium score means. And we talked about that. For those over 100, it's pretty clear. Um, for those people over age 55, basically any calcium qualifies them for going forward with more aggressive statin therapy. I think where there's going to be a problem is understanding the 75th percentile. And this is an opportunity for us as a society uh, to educate people. Uh, the key thing for all of us to understand, if you're a man less than 50 years old or a woman less than 60 years old, any calcium, even a calcium score of one, puts them at above the 75th percentile. Uh, and so it's a, I think we're going to have to do a good job as a society because I think a lot of people are going to get the wrong message that if you're a 50-year-old, 45-year-old uh, man or a 50-year-old wo woman with a calcium score of 10, that they don't meet the treatment guidelines, but they meet them based on the 75th percentile. So I think we're going to be uh, challenged by these new guidelines as a society to update some of our reporting language and to talk about how people exceed the 75th percentile. So for most men and women, uh, under age 60, if they have any coronary calcium, they're going to be above the 75th percentile of plaque burden, and they're going to qualify for statin therapy. Uh, these are the charts from MESA, so for time, I'm going to skip over that. Uh, so in conclusion, lifestyle changes, team-based approach, and the 10-year risk assessment are further enhanced in the 2018-2019 guidelines. I think overall they're going to be much better received than the 2013 guidelines because I think the committees have done a really good job of incorporating what we actually do in practice to how we manage patients in a more personalized way. Uh, the coronary artery calcium score is now recommended as part of the risk assessment process. And uh, for us as a society and imagers, we're going to have to update how we report the calcium score to include the 75th percentile language. So with that, thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, you know, the, so the way this is structured is that we have a 20-minute discussion at the end, but I think that in the interest of keeping, you know, sort of it into our, uh, like, just the front of our minds, like, maybe we try to take a couple of questions right after each uh, lecture. Uh, just before I, I say that, the two things. The first is that um, if you were here for the last session and you just stayed here for the, this session, um, you, you need to rescan your badge in order to get the CME credit, so just a housekeeping thing. And the second is, whoever has a question, do you mind uh, going up to the microphone to, to ask it so the whole group can, can hear? While he goes up, so um, John. Hi, uh, Jonathan Lessig from Israel. Uh, why do you think the guidelines committees decided to ignore the MISA calcium risk score, which takes, incorporates the calcium score together with the clinical risk score? and seems much more logical, especially let's take the case of a seven-year-old man who has a calcium score of five. 
that calcium score is actually going to reduce his risk and not increase his risk. So if we had the full score, that would actually give a much clearer, better picture of his real risk. So I think the question is, uh, why did the committees not come up with a new risk calculator that included coronary calcium in the 10-year atherosclerotic risk? I think that um, I think there were probably some practical reasons why. There were some validation reasons. I think there's uh, incremental growth in the guidelines, but I agree completely that that would be an optimal uh, situation that we had one calculator that would incorporate it all in together. But I think in reality, uh, the committee was swayed by trying to keep it simplistic and to keep uh, office-based risk assessment without requirement of getting a CT scan to do the risk calculator. That the first step is trying to get more people to just understand what their 10-year risk is using traditional risk factors. And I think uh, by not uh, adding the calcium score, that makes it easier for family physicians, nurse practitioners to go ahead and calculate that right away. I think your other point, which is really important and where we have to message better is that the cut point of a Agassiz score of 100 really falls out of the equation. It all comes down to the 75th percentile. When you look at the MESA ranges of scores and percentiles, for younger adults and really for people under 75, regardless of your race, ethnicity, and gender, if you have any coronary calcium, you're gonna be above the 75th percentile or you're gonna be above 55 and your other risk is gonna take you to the risk strata of where statin is definitely something that should be considered or required in the new guidelines. And, and you're exactly right that, that where the 75th percentile and this comes in is in older adults where you might actually lower their risk and they might uh, with good reason defer uh, going with more aggressive statin based on not having coronary artery disease. And so I think the, the committees put those discussions of the calcium zero in there for that very reason. But good point. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Jeff. We'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, we want to, uh, to call Dr. Harvard Hesch. He's going to talk about adoptions of the NICE guidelines. Dr. Uh, Harvard Hesch is Director of Cardiology at the Mount Sinai Hospital at St. Luke's and Professor of Cardiology in the Inkai School of Medicine. Welcome. Thank you. So my disclosure is as written here. I must add that the opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the author alone and hopefully the majority of the audience and should not be interpreted as those of the SECT and certainly not of the ACC or AHA. <laughs> yeah, you were supposed to introduce me as a non-controversial person. You forgot about that. Okay, well let's start with the old guidelines and this is the one that still is operative in this country anyhow. And you look at it and you say, oh my God, what's going on here? This is just so complicated to look at. And you really have to go through all the fine print. And if you're looking for coronary calcium, there it is, right? So it's small print and it's hard to find. And it's really, oh, oh and these are the associated recommendations, stress echo, SPECT, CMR, and CTA are all category two, but CTA is a 2B and the others are all 2A. In Europe, it's exactly the same thing. It's very complicated and you have to search for CTA and there it is. And again, stress echo, SPECT and CMR are all level one and CTA is level two. Well, What's happened since then? In 2014, this landmark paper showing that the, the almost half, more than half of patients who end up in the cath lab, stable patients, do not have obstructive disease when preceded, when their route to the cath lab was dictated by conventional stress testing, stress echo, MPI, MR, all in the 45% range, but with CTA, it was 70%. So that gave us an inkling that CTA was better at detecting obstructive disease. 
And this is really a summary with some bias on my part, perhaps, of everything that favors CTA over the most widely used modalities of stress echo and nuclear. There are a host of papers now demonstrating that CTA is more accurate, has a better prognostic value, improves outcomes more than the other technologies, and is cost effective. So let's take that as a given, and when we talk about what would happen if the NICE guidelines were approved universally, or certainly in this country, this is a given, and I'm really not going to dwell on that anymore. And then based upon those data, the NICE and cost-effective data, the NICE guidelines came out in 2016. And it really trashed the concept of pretest probability. It doesn't matter whether it's low, intermediate, or high. The first test that you do is always a coronary CTA, period. This was not applicable to patients with known coronary disease. Why? I think not so much because they didn't think it should be, but because there really are very few studies dealing with the accuracy of CAD in patients who do have known coronary disease. The rest of the NICE guidelines here talk about what you do after the CTA is done, not whether or not other technology should be the first test. This is a paper that just came out two months ago in EHJ, should NICE guidelines be universally accepted for the evaluation of stable coronary disease, a debate. It wasn't a vitriolic debate at all. And these were the general conclusions of at least the data. With invasive cath as greater than 50% stenosis as the reference point, CTA, MRI, and PET are the most sensitive and specific modalities. SPECT and stress echo are less sensitive and specific. With invasive FFR less than 0.8 or equal to 0.8 as the reference, again, CTA, MR, and PET are the most sensitive, and MRI and PET are the most specific. CTA is the least specific, but the addition of CTFFR and CTP, CT perfusion, increase the specificity to the level of MR and PET without loss of sensitivity. Again, the losers are SPECT and stress echo, the most commonly used modalities. And the conclusion was that you could make a case for being the, the scales of CTA being balanced. The pros are obvious, higher sensitivity, better prognosticator, improves outcomes in medical treatment. Cons, lower specificity, no functional component, and less availability. But when you add CTFFR or CTP or the ability to detect high-risk plaque, the scales are tilted definitely in favor of CTA. It should also be mentioned that not part of that guideline, but subsequently in 2017, CTFFR or heart flow FFRCT should be considered an option for patients with stable recent onset chest pain who are offered CCTA as part of the NICE pathway on chest pain. So this is a NICE guideline as well, and that's why I've included it in this talk. So we've talked a little bit about the impact on outcomes, on costs, on prognosis of using CTA, but what does this mean for the most commonly used modalities, the future role of stress echo and SPECT? Should it be used in patients with known CAD, whom the NICE guidelines did not address? And I would say a resounding no. The NICE guidelines should apply to known coronary disease. A vessel is a vessel, irrespective of the history. What difference does it make whether they have established coronary disease? CTA is excellent for stent and cabbage. It differentiates between CTOs and severe stenoses and may obviate the need for cath. It differentiates between graft and native vessel disease and also may obviate the need for cath. Stress echo and SPECT are suboptimal for multivessel disease and PET and MR are superior to stress echo and SPECT. What about using it after equivocal CTA or intermediate stenoses? Again, no, because FFRCT is included in the NICE guideline with a much superior correlation to invasive FFR than stress echo and SPECT, and again, PET and MR are superior to stress echo and SPECT. What about cases in which CTA is contraindicated? CKD, or I think it should be contraindicated in contrast to anaphylaxis. Again, no. PET and MR are superior to stress echo and SPECT, and you wouldn't use MR and CKD, but you can certainly use PET under those circumstances. Will it affect appropriate use criteria or appropriate use in general? And yes, it will. It will dramatically increase because there's only one option. You have to do the CTA first. But 
this is dependent upon Medicare and the insurance company enforcing this, just as in the past, or even in the present in some places, you can only do a CTA if you've already done a stress echo or a nuclear and the results are equivocal. It will flip, it should flip. You can only do the other test, and even then I think it's questionable, if you've already done the CTA, but it's important that the government and the insurance agencies implement that. Is it the gateway to the cath lab? Yes, it already is. Less than 50% stenosis medical treatment. Intermediate stenosis, you can do a CTFFR. Positive, go to cath. Negative medical treatment. Greater than 70% stenosis, go straight to the cath lab. How about this one? Gateway to the operating room without cath using the CTA Syntex 2 score. And in the Syntex 3 revolution study, first phase compared invasive angiography syntax score to the CTA syntax score, correlation 0.98 with an almost perfect agreement regarding de delegation to either bypass surgery or PCI. Phase two, which is enrolling patients, an outcome study randomized to cabbage post-CTA alone without cath versus bypass surgery based upon invasive angiography. Did we ever think it would come to this? Let's get to the, perhaps the heart of the matter in terms of how it applies to this country. What are the financial implications? Between 2007 and 2017, the percentage of physician-owned cardiology practices declined from 64% to 34%. I asked this question, and I don't expect anybody in the room to have the answer, but if you do, please let me know. What percentage of income of the remaining 34% is derived from functional testing, stress echo, nuclear, or treadmill tests. Is it 25%, is it 50%, is it 75%? I don't know the answer to this. And I don't know if that data is available, but I would assume it's at least 25%. So the prediction that I would make is that the physician-owned cardiology practices at some point in the future would decline to zero because the resultant cut in income will make it impractical for them to practice on, the own, on their own. They could still do resting echocardiography, but they will be reduced to the level, and I'm not saying it's bad, of, of an internist or a family practitioner. You make your living from E&M. Will that be accepted? Good question. So then the last question is, will the NICE guidelines be adopted? This is an old Spike Lee movie. I don't know if you, you know who Spike Lee is. It was called Do the Right Thing. Well, this is the current American guidelines. You see them, I talked about them before, stress echo, SPECT, MR, and CTA. The best case scenario in terms of what the ACC AHA will do with this, the stable chest pain guidelines that I think are expected in November would be this, an appropriate reduction in stress echo to 2B, SPECT, Maybe you'd want to reduce it as well, but let's leave it at 2A for the moment. MR, PET, and CTA should be elevated to 1A because that's what the data indicate. Would we settle for putting CTA on the same level as the other tests? Uh, reluctantly. I, I, really, the data don't support that, but I think a lot of us would probably settle for that so we don't have to do one of those other tests before we do a CTA, if it doesn't change at all, it is a travesty. So my question, my final question here is, will the ACC AHA do the right thing? And a cartoon, a little levity. I'd have been here much later, but my doctor did not follow the NICE guideline. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to ask any question to the doctor? John. Harvey, when you see a patient now in New York, do you do a CT first? When I see patients in New York, do I do a CT first? Absolutely. 
Payment is, you know, there are a lot of ways to get payment. Um, and most of the time, or a lot of times, the insurance companies will say, you have to do a stress test first. But gosh, there are so many reasons why patients can't do stress tests. They have arthritis, they have COPD, they are frail. They're on a beta blocker, which I just put them on, and they can't get their heart rate up high enough, so you can't do a stress test. And they're not smart enough, the insurance companies, to say, well, do a vasodilator test. So I had, the last time I've had a patient rejected was with Blue Cross Blue Shield, who across the board are nonsensical. So yeah, I order them as the first test in every patient who, I'm, who needs it. And the pre-authorization is almost 100%. Harvey, great talk. The data is there. There were two million, roughly two million specs done last year and rough for Medicare and roughly 100,000 CTAs. 25% of cardiologists' income to 20% is from imaging. So those are the numbers you probably wanted. But that, one, that 20 to 1, I think, has almost reached a criminal level based on the evidence base. And so we certainly all have to do something about it. Thanks, Ryan. All right, thanks so much, Harvey. We are going to move to the other session. We thank you very much, Dr. Harvers, for its nice presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sania Barra, president of the SSCT, professor of radiology and chief of the cardiothoracic imaging division at US Southwestern, and chief of cardiothoracic imaging of Parkland Health and Hospital System. He's Great. going to be talking about spectral imaging. Thank you very much. Boy, that was something. <laughs> All right, so um, spectral detector CT or spectral CT is my topic. These are my disclosures. There is one that's perhaps relevant. Um, we have relationships as an uh, institution with many organizations. I want to point out the Philips one. We had the privilege of having a prototype CT scanners for three years, and some of the data are derived from that uh, scanner. Um, so we've come a long way in cardiac CT from the first SCCT or the meetings, six meetings preceding that. Um, I have to say it's really wonderful witnessing that. But there are a lot of challenges that we still face today. Um, those of us that when you're in the weeds, uh, we still have to overcome respiratory or cardiac motion issues in some patients. We still do use radiation. Uh, renal dysfunction is a problem. Blooming artifacts, stents and calcium, still a challenge today in some. Um, characterization of non-calcified plaque uh, is we're much, much more data is out there, but we are not there yet, still a challenge. Perfusion of the myocardium, uh, perfusion quantification is an issue. There's beam hardening from the lumen of the left ventricle and so forth. And scar imaging is still much inferior compared to, say, MRI late gallium enhancement. Um, and highlighted here in, in red, um, you could actually add radiation even in that, are uh, the areas where spectral CT may have an impact um, on, on these areas where there still is a challenge uh, today. So first, what is spectral CT? We've, a lot of us have used the term dual energy CT kind of slightly in a wrong way because we're talking about energy spectra and um, Basically, all of the different vendors, modalities out there today, you could argue is all spectral CT, and there are two fundamentally different ways of getting there. There's the source-based spectral CT, where you emit two different spectra of radiations that are separate, different KVPs through the patient. And then on the other side, um, for each of these, you get a sinogram, two separate sinograms for each. This is your rapid KV switching, your dual source, your split beam, and your scan twice approach. And then the other approach that you would contrast that to is the detector-based CT. Fundamental difference is a single spectrum goes through the patient. And on the detector side, either through photon counting or through the spectral detector technique, the sandwich detector, you then separate out energy bins um, uh, on that side. But you have a single, it's, you could argue it's single energy because you shoot a single spectrum through the patient. So very different approach. So this is what I will be focusing on. There's right now only one FDA approved uh, uh, device that's a spectral detector and there are a couple prototype systems also for the uh, photon counting 
uh, CT system. So this is how they work, like a third generation gantry CT, um, where you spin around the patient like usual, and um, in this case with the spectral detector, you have the sandwich um, of one detector seeing the lower energy, and then the larger second detector seeing the higher energy photons. And in reality, those are the spectra that they read, so the area below the curve is where they overlap, so that information doesn't differentiate, but the sum of the areas between those curves are differentiating information that you get from these two detectors. So detector-based spectral CT is what we're talking about. And what you get is what we're uh, now used to since more than a decade from dual energy CT. So for every phase of your cardiac CT, you don't just get one 120 kVp image, you get all of these and more. There's, a, there's actually dozens more uh, than this. But basically an iodine map that you can use for quantification of the amount of iodine in there. Since you know how much in there, you can take it out and you get a virtual non-contrast image. You can get the effective Z, basically an average of the atomic number within the voxel, since all voxels are so mixed, it's, it's hard to know what that's good for. And then you can get a whole spectrum, usually ranging from 40 kilo electron volt to 200 kilo electron volt, simulated or virtual monoenergetic images uh, throughout uh, those ranges. Um, and what is that good for in cardiac CT? Well, you can use the various things. Uh, this is just to show that the potential clinical applications, a lot of them use that virtual monoenergetic. Some use the iodine map, and others use the virtual unenhanced images. There's more, but these are perhaps the most common and uh, the more promising one. So low monoenergetic imaging, what does that mean? It's the lower spectrum of the monoenergetic images where your, your iodine signal, the Hounsfield units, that I should put it in quotation mark, it's not really Hounsfield units anymore, but what you measure, the CT numbers, will be much higher for iodine than they are at uh, 120 kVp. Those are good for contrast boosting, and we've seen that with the original dual energy um, publications, where at the right ventricle, this is the same scan, same data set, uh, reconstructed 100 kEV, and then here at 40 kEV, you see much more contrast, or it looks like there's more contrast, uh, more signal from the contrast in that same right ventricle um, on the same scan. So what's it good for? Um, it's good, for example, for doing very low contrast acquisitions. This is a TAVR scan that uh, Prabhakar Rajir um, uh, did uh, when he still was at Cleveland. The images you get at 120 kVp will not look very good. The idea is that you look at the low monoenergetic imaging, and this was just of diagnostic quality using only 20 cc's for both the cardiac and the chest abdomen pelvis CT. Not to be outdone, um, here is what I uh, received from a group in Japan. Um, man, I was jealous when I saw that. They totally uh, beat us. Um, they did this coronary CT at only seven cc's, and you may look at this and go like, well, nothing special, right? But look at it at 50 keV, and I will show you the coronaries. And by the way, they put, look, this is the water bottle, it has a cap. One and a half of these caps is seven cc's. That is not very much contrast. Um, so this is the CTA. To me, that looks diagnostic. I have to say, um, in, in uh, Dallas, Texas, where I practice, we probably have less patients that are thin enough to get away with only seven, so we might just use nine cc's, or I don't know. <laughs> All right. and. Um, so here's one of the early publications using this uh, uh, detector-based uh, spectral CT approach, comparing basically a low KVP scan closer to the KH of iodine, so you get more signal out of it, to the spectral uh, detector CT uh, scan. And um, they found basically uh, at very low radiation doses, um, they looked at uh, signal and contrast to noise ratios and qualitative assessment, and these are their data. Let me just help you read this. This is all the group A, that's the spectral CT patient, and that is group B, that's the 100 kVp. Obviously, you only get one reconstruction if you don't have spectral information. And within this group A, they have low moon energetic all the way to high moon energetic, and then the conventional 120 kVp image. You can see that in the aorta and the coronary arteries, the, these low moon energetic images have the highest contrast to noise ratio, not surprisingly. Um, but this is, to my knowledge, the first uh, publication actually showing that. And here are the images. This is your B, the 100 kVp image, and that is the low monoenergetic image, um, which uh, looks the best. It did so on their Likert scale uh, as well. 
Um, can you use that to salvage a suboptimal study? Uh, for example, a PE study where you maybe missed the bon uh, bolus, can you use it to salvage it? Um, we have used it. It is, in my opinion, better than the source-based approaches of dual energy because they get pretty noisy at that low uh, K KEV, not so much here. And there has been a recent publication um, uh, of, from Korea looking at that and quantifying that. They looked at their first 1,500 uh, chest CTAs and they found that 79 were suboptimal as defined as less than 180 uh, uh, Hounsfield units. Um, and they uh, looked at them at low monogenic images and found that actually 78 of the 79 then were um, uh, substantially improved and of diagnostic quality. So first study that somehow is trying to attempt quantifying this. These are the contrast and, uh, to noise ratio and Hounsfield unit measurements. Hounsfield units alone are not meaningful because you could have a lot of noise. You can see this curve dips down a little, but um, wow, 15 times the CNR, that's uh, a CNR of 15 as opposed to 7, that is um, substantially better at low mono E. And they attempted, this is slightly problematic because of the methods of this paper, but they attempted to quantify uh, the, the accuracy, looking at the accuracy, and found that the readers had higher accuracy in the uh, low monogenic images. Not the best study design. It's very hard to design this. This was a retrospective study, but uh, I would say this is perhaps promising or feasible. Um, these are some of their images. This is your 120 kVp image, and then that would be your rescue 40 kEV image uh, with higher contrast to noise ratio. Not to forget, you also get the iodine perfusion maps, uh, which may have some incremental value. In my practice, it's actually only in these smaller segmental obstructive PEs and not so much in larger uh, lobar or uh, other uh, PEs. Iodine quantification can be used for the myocardium as well, and um, we didn't believe this, so uh, we created our own phantoms and found that it actually uh, maps really well, even with different background intensities in the lumen, say, of the left ventricle in this phantom. Um, you can take that and create your, your virtual arterial, uh, first of all, virtual non-contrast phase. Uh, in this case, there's an endoleak here. You want to make sure it's not calcium. It disappears. So that works. And we created a virtual arterial phase uh, of this delayed scan, so where the lumen now is closer to arterial enhancement, and it helps seeing that endoleak. Um, so virtual arterial phase, getting rid of both the true arterial and the true non-contrast phase would cut your chest up on pelvis uh, dose down by three because you're going down to one phase out of three. And we did a paper looking at that and quantifying the CNR and everything um, and came to that exact same conclusion. Uh, this is from radiology cardiothoracic imaging, looking at late iodine enhancement, um, quantifying extracellular volume and looking at delayed enhancement. I thought this was a really exciting paper because late gadolinium enhancement is our gold standard for scar imaging today because it has substantially better contrast to noise ratio than our conventional images. And this study found that actually your, uh, your iodine density images have the best contrast to noise ratio in late iodine enhancement, which is really much better than the 120 kVp. So, Maybe in the future we can more routinely or, or more frequently do late iodine enhancement um, without that big CNR penalty. Um, let me just skip that. They found uh, a, great, a, a very good correlation between CT-derived extracellular volume and MRI-derived extracellular volume using these scans. Here's your blunt Altman, and uh, the R square is 0.94, which is, uh, is really good. And here the image is showing you uh, the two. This is the, the MRI map of your extracellular volume, where red is uh, increased, and here's the CT map, um, which I don't know that it's necessarily needed, but CT, of course, has a much better spatial resolution. That's why the images look uh, nicer here. It's not just in plane, it's also through plane compared to MR, and it, it looks like it's non-inferior. So this is, uh, I thought, a cool, uh, somewhat new application. And here's a publication from CERC Cardiovascular Imaging using that extracellular volume map um, and a low mono E um, iodine, late iodine enhancement map looking at a, a patient with an acute coronary syndrome and an acute infarct right in this um, area in that diagonal branch. 
Um, and with that, I think I'm out of time. This was my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thanks so much, Suni. Are there any questions for this? I see Harvey going up. Yeah. Do you have any data on how effective this is for eliminating calcium from the CTAs? Uh, yes, so there are some slides that unfortunately didn't get to out of time. They're, the possibilities are endless. You can differentiate calcium from iodine and remove them. My question for you would be, well, but the blooming artifact, that's not reality. Are you removing the blooming corona as well? Wouldn't that cause error? We are doing something that is called CT fingerprinting that will help differentiate true calcium from iodine. You can get probably a we, we're, we have a phantom build. We did the first scans, and I predict uh, Praveen Ranganath, I don't know if he is in here. Yeah, here he is. So he's doing that work. Look at that guy. You will hear a lot from him. He will give us the new Agatson score that is perhaps more exact and reliable than the current score, and you will be able to get that same information from contrast enhanced scan. At least that is the hypothesis, and we are cautiously optimistic. Any other question? I would like to ask you something. Uh, when uh, you work assistentially, you reduce in all patients the contrast dose uh, for all the uh, CT and geography studies, and if you do so, how much is the reduction? Uh, so we actually, we're chickens, I think. We don't reduce it ah. in most patients. We actually, for most patients, we do nothing. We already ah. are a low-dose site. Um, we only minimize the dose in patients with renal failure or, or other renal concerns, and when we do so, we, we use the same injection protocol except that the pure iodine gets replaced um, by 50-50 iodine saline, or sometimes we go as low as 1 cc of iodine uh, and uh, 4 cc's of saline. Depends also on in the indication. If you're looking for crony anomalies um, or larger structures, we, we go even lower. Thank you. Any other questions? Great. Thanks so much, Suni. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on to the, uh, the next talk, which is uh, being given by my dear friend Jagat Narula. He's giving a talk on identification of high-risk plaques. I would assume that he will re uh, refer to his article from 2009 from Sadako Murayama. It's hard to believe that it's been 10 years, but I think students of the field will realize that Jagat's been thinking about the high-risk plaque for, for much longer than that. Uh, Jagat? Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Patricia. And uh, so, uh, talking about the high-risk plaques and sticking to the 10 minutes, so I thought I'll say 10 points to ponder in 10 minutes. So let's see whether I can stick to 10 minutes. I will definitely discuss 10 points, but uh, 10 minutes is questionable. Um, so, uh, number one that uh, we all know what is the uh, high-risk plaque, and as you can see in the middle panel here, uh, the large plaque, that there is a large plaque, large necrotic core full of cholesterol crystals. You'll see that there is a thin inflamed fibrous cap on top of that, and uh, if I could show you with, this, with the marker here, so this is the thin fibrous cap, and a lot of inflammation that you can see here with the blue color. Now. On the upper right-hand panel also, there is a plaque, which is a vulnerable plaque or high-risk plaque, large necrotic core, thin fibrous cap here, and similarly here also, there's a large necrotic core and a thin fibrous cap. The lumen is not affected here. Lumen is modestly affected here, and lumen is critically affected here. And you see that when the large necrotic cores are uh, uh, deposited, they still can be dangerous because the large necrotic cores, which are one of the most important signs of the vulnerable plaques, they produce the positive remodeling, as you can see here, which was considered to be the Glagaus phenomenon. So when we looked at the 300 hearts, we identified that uh, the, if we have the invasive means to identify a, a high-risk plaque, the most important uh, characteristic of the high-risk plaques is the fibrous cap thickness. And when it is less than 85 micron, these plaques are considered to be the plaques which are vulnerable to rupture. And when the plaques have already ruptured, normally their fibrous caps are under 55 microns. But if you do not have that, 
And if you only have the non-invasive means to identify these plaques, the best is to look at the amount of macrophages and also to the size of necrotic core. So essentially, two most important determinants of vulnerable plaque that could be subjected to the non-invasive imaging are the necrotic core size, and the second would be the degree of inflammation. Now, when we first presented this paper, and as uh, Dr. Min just suggested that I should start with 2009, I probably will start from 2005 when we compared the intravascular ultrasound with the CT angiograms, and this time we only had the 16 slice uh, CT angiograms. And as you can see here, the two most important things that we were able to identify was the uh, correlation in the Hounsfield unit densities and the intravascular ultrasound determined fibrous plaques, the necrotic cores, the lumen, and the calcium at that time. And then also that we would be able to identify the positive remodeling of these plaques. When it comes to inflammation, CT does help in identifying the inflammation also, and that is essentially when it is used in addition to the FDG, as has been shown by Ahmed Tavakol and his colleagues from um, Mass General Hospital. And as you can clearly see, that these areas of the stent placement in the acute coronary syndromes, they light up with the FDG. However, here you would require a PET imaging in addition to the CT, and recent papers which come from uh, Stefan Achenbach's group uh, with his colleagues from um, Oxford, where they have looked at the amount of adipogenesis around the vessel or the peri perivascular fat attenuation index as they presented, that normally whenever the plaque is inflamed, there is less of an adipogenesis uh, around the vessel, and hence the, the, uh, the Hounsfield unit densities here would be minus 70 or higher than that as compared to the other pericardial fat, which would be quite different, and they look at the diameter of a vessel and then create a circle around the vessel, which is of the same diameter, and if this is minus 70 or higher, you would see that they have a higher likelihood of having an event over the next up to five years. Now, when we look at the CT angiography and look at the morphologic characteristics, you'll see that in the patients who had had acute coronary syndromes, the two most important features were the low attenuation plaque when the plaque density was less than 35 Hounsfield units. So that is one. And the second was the presence of positive remodeling. Here you would see that there is a positive remodeling in a patient with unstable angina. And here is a low attenuation plaque. So large necrotic core and positive remodeling. On the other hand, when we looked at the stable disease, the most important thing that you find is the fibrous plaque in these cases, as you could see here, and also large calcification, uh, un unlike what you see in the patients with acute coronary syndrome, that the spotty calcification is most likely, the more likely to be present as compared to the large calcification, which is more likely to be present in the patients who have stable disease. So here is a stable plaque, there is a waste here or a negative remodeling, while there is a fibrous plaque, no uh, positive remodeling, no necrotic cores or low attenuation plaques. Now, when you look at the uh, adverse plaque characteristics, as Dr. Min's group has called it, the, they do predict outcome. And as you would see in this 2007 paper, uh, that we had uh, with uh, uh, Motoyama, we uh, found that uh, it should be 2007, not 2009. So in this paper, we had found that uh, if there were two feature positive plaques or versus two feature negative plaques, the plaques which did not have positive remodeling and the plaques which did not have the uh, low attenuation plaques, they had a much superior outcome in the two years follow-up with uh, less than 0.5% likelihood of having an event as compared to 22.5% likelihood of having an event with uh, the two feature positive plaques, that is when there was a presence of positive remodeling and the low attenuation plaque, giving us a hazard ratio in two years of 45 is to one. Not only that, the dose of the adverse plaque characteristics matters here that larger the remodeling or greater the remodeling index, larger the plaque volume, larger the low attenuation plaque volume or necrotic core volume, more likelihood of having an event, and earlier would the event occur after the CT angiography is done. 
It has recently also been demonstrated that it is not only the, the dose of the, uh, the adverse plaque characteristics, but also the number of plaque characteristics. And that was also presented by Dr. Min's data approximately three years ago, that larger the numbers of the adverse plaque characteristics and adverse hemodynamic characteristics, more is the or greater is the likelihood of having an event. As you can see here that these are the number of high risk plaque characteristics and as they increase, there is a higher likelihood of having an event. And uh, again, for a five year follow up, this is from Dr. Akasaka's group. You will see here that these are the subjects with more than 0 0.8 FFR. In them, if there are more than um, uh, three uh, high risk plaque characteristics, the likelihood of having an event is about 15% as compared to 5% when it is less than three high risk plaque characteristics. Now, the problem with all the, all the methodologies that we have or all the strategies that we use, the negative predictive value of all these strategies is very high, specifically when we talk about all the non-invasive techniques, that the, non, non, the negative predictive values are very high. However, the positive predictive values really are pretty low for most of the things that we can consider, and they may range between uh, 4% to up to about 22.5% uh, and 22.5% is the CT and geography giving us the best positive predictive value. Now what is it that we can enhance the positive predictive value? So this is our 15 years follow up, uh, 10 years follow up uh, uh, of the CT and geography in 3,000 subjects. And as you can see here in this case that the non-high risk plaque is a non-high risk plaque and here is the high risk plaque which has a 10 fold higher likelihood of having an event over the next 10 years. However, the non-high risk plaques do not appear to be as benign as we found in the two year study. And essentially, again, if you will go to two years, you will see that the outcomes are extremely favorable for the next two years. But as the time goes by, some of these high risk plaques would eventually result in a uh, high risk plaque also and might result in an event. So what, what is it that identifies the immediate uh, 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 likelihood of having an unfavorable outcome. And one is the presence of the significant stenosis here. As you will see that if the significant stenosis with a high risk plaque, it does much worse as compared to high risk plaque without the significant stenosis. But the most important thing was that when we had the availability of two scans, that is the scan done at an interval of approximately one year, the progression of the plaque was the most important thing that we found. For example, here you would see that the high-risk plaque with a plaque progression over the next one year had a 35-fold higher likelihood of having an event as compared to high-risk plaque. We did not show the progression over the next one year. And here, as you would see, that these have an absolutely uneventful uh, uh, outcome in these cases. Now, on one hand, we believe, and that has become now the gold standard, that the FFR is the most important thing that determines the, uh, the uh, outcomes in these subjects. On the other hand, we try to demonstrate that these are the plaque characteristics, and we have always believed that the plaque characteristics are important that determine the, the outcome. We thought that there might be some relationship between the FFR and the plaque characteristics. And when we looked at Dr. Nogard's data from the NXT trial, and as you would see here, that when we, the, uh, uh, these cases had uh, available to us the QCA by CT and the FFR by CT, the QCA and FFR by the invasive coronary angiography, as well as the plaque characteristics, you find that the FFR is correlated not only to the QCA, which is what is intuitive, but also to the presence of the necrotic core. And it is important to realize that the necrotic core provides us the functional stenosis or uh, the dynamic stenosis in these cases, because when you give the adenosine or other vasodilators quite like nitroglycerin to these subjects, that area cannot be dilated further where the epicardial stenosis is and uh, essentially results in a functional stenosis in these cases. And here is one of the examples. This is a 72 years old uh, 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 male patient. And uh, as you will, uh, uh, this is the uh, figure that comes to me from uh, uh, Amir Ahmadi and uh, uh, 
Dr. Jonathan Leipzig's group, and as you would see here that he has got a huge positive remodeling, essentially providing a Glegovian limit here that this, whatever vasodilators you give him, it cannot go any further while the area proximal to it and area distal to it would have uh, the uh, significant dilatation creating a dynamic stenosis at this place. And that is what exactly is happening in this particular case. And you would see here the FFR by CD, and you can see that there is a significant drop here from 0.89 to 0.76. However, since the lesion here was only approximately 25%, and the patient was uh, not too keen to go to the, uh, to, uh, uh, for the coronary angiography, and similarly, the uh, interventionist also was not quite keen to pick him up, we started him or we uh, 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 maximized his uh, statin therapy. And uh, as you can see here, that the, uh, the lipid-rich core has significantly reduced in size. The fibrous cap thickness, if at all we can identify it by the CT and geography, has increased. And uh, if you look at the FFR in this particular case, it has significantly resolved. So, can we talk about the positive, uh, 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 I'm sorry, can we talk about the, the plaque progression versus plaque regression in these cases? So if plaque progression is important for the events to occur, is there a possibility that if there is a plaque regression, we possibly would be able to decrease the likelihood of, ev of events? And as we saw in our 10-year follow-up study, that whenever there was no plaque progression, there was no likelihood of an event over a period of time. So as you can see in this particular study, again, done with the um, the uh, group in the Fujita University, we demonstrated that the uh, size of the necrotic core, as you can see here, that comes out significantly, uh, de reduces significantly, and it is proportional to the decrease in the total plaque volume in such cases. And it is definitely possible that we would be able to reduce the likelihood of having the events in these cases. Now, we know from the intravascular ultrasound studies that if we drop the LDL values down to 70, and that comes from various statin trials, that the progression of the plaque stops. However, if you really want to see the regression of the plaque, we have got to go lower than that, and now you know that it is much easier to obtain the levels down to even 50s or 30s of LDL cholesterol. Now, would it be possible that we will be able to identify the plaque characteristics? So yes, the CT and geography is probably the easiest way to do it. However, we do not have any evidence in our hands where we demonstrate that this is truly related to uh, the uh, events or the uh, improvement in the plaque characteristic eventually would result in the better outcomes. However, there is one of the very elegant study which I would like to bring up here and would like to end with that particular study. This is the data that come from uh, the FAME 2 study. And these are the people who had uh, less than 0.8 FFR, but they were in the control arm, which were treated only by the medical therapy. And here you would see that the wall shear stress has been uh, performed on the coronary angiograms with the 3D reconstruction in these cases. And here you would see that there is a high wall shear stress as compared to the low wall shear stress. And you'll see that approximately 50% of the people had low wall shear stress and 50% of the people had high wall shear stress. And those who had the high wall shear stress, they had significantly worse outcomes as compared to those who had the low wall shear stress, again suggesting that if wall shear stress is being determined, which it does from the plaque characteristics, then we probably in the 50% of the cases, we should be able to identify them and reduce our uh, referral or indications for the uh, revascularization. So putting it all together, as we have done in one of our recent editorials for uh, Jack, you will see that what we used to do or what we always thought was that anything which is more than 70% occlusive should be sent for revascularization. However, when the functional uh, parameters were included, that is the FFR was uh, added 
added to it or uh, introduced, you will see that 33% of the less lesions were likely to be submitted for uh, the revascularization. And if you look at the FAME 2 data, whereas there is a five years follow-up, you can see that 50% of the people who have been followed for five years on the medical therapy, they did not require any revascularization, and their angina class was similar to what the revascularization was. And as we saw in the wall shear stress study also, that we should be able to reduce it further by 50%, bringing down the revascularization need to less than 33% of what we used to think is something that will benefit by revascularization. So to end, I would say that CT and geography provides it all. It provides us stenosis, provides us FFR, provides us plaque characterization. And if we have it all, then CT and geography can do it all. So super CT and geography. Thank you. All right, th thanks so much, Jagat. Um, if there are any questions, just so you know, Jagat and Harvey work at the same place, so you sort of sense a theme here. <laughs> um, any questions? Actually, this slide was supposed to be shown by Harvey, and I, I stole it from him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're running a little behind, so thank you very much, Jagat. We'll move on to the next talk. Yes, we want to invite Dr. Uh, John Lester. He's going to talk about cyclical mitral valve intervention. Dr. Lesser is director of a cardiovascular CT and MR at Minneapolis Heart Institute, and he's past president of the SCT. Welcome. Thank you. This is not going to be as good as the last talk. That was fantastic. <laughs> Here we go. So I'm here today to talk to you about how CT can guide mitral valve interventions, and this is a rapidly evolving field. With severe mitral insufficiency, it's more prevalent with age, and over half people don't get referred to surgery because of so many comorbidities. So there's a very large clinical need for minimally invasive therapy. And you divide mitral insufficiency basically into two groups. One, and there's a lot of overlap, in the primary group, a non-surgical approach could be a mitral clip, which would be a repair on most of those uh, etiologies. And then in secondary MR, you have poor leaflet coaptation, and potentially TMVR would be a, a therapy for that, where the left ventricular uh, annulus enlarges either from the atrial atrium enlarging or the left ventricle. You get annular growth, and you can also have leaflet tethering and tenting. How do we acquire the scans? The better the scanner, the better the result. You want a biphasic injection, get the whole cycle, and if you need the apex for access, you need to have a separate uh, chest scan. We use retrospective ECG gating with tube current modulation where you can see the valve ring well for valve and valve or valve and ring. But if you're looking at the native uh, mitral annulus, we use full radiation for that. Now, you have to have dedicated software. I think there's one group out there that can do it without it, but it would be very labor intensive. So you want to segment out the valve ring. Then you place your uh, virtual valve and use the point in the cycle where the aortic valve is still open but not quite closed, and that's mid toward end systole. And then you can calculate in planimeter the neo-LVOT area. You can obtain the angle for deployment and be sure that you can achieve that in the cath lab. And then if you need the apical access, you have that available to you, and you want to get to the point in the apex, it's not actually the true apex, that's completely coaxial with the mitral valve. This is less and less used depending upon the valve that you're using. For TMVR valve and valve, LVOT obstruction is a key issue, although it's not very common. It's only 2 to 3 percent, and the, by definition, if you have an outflow gradient of 10 millimeters over the baseline, and that would be outflow obstruction. It can become provocable as well. The aortomitral angle is an indication where the more sharp it is, or the more perpendicular, the more likely it will occur. The degree of septal hypertrophy, the small left ventricle. And when you place these valves in a mitral valve prosthesis, you have to flare the edge so it doesn't pop out. And that can also lead more to outflow obstruction. 
Now, a key issue is the anterior mitral leaflet. We're going to talk more about that. That's very hard to account for when you're looking at a CT. Now, what do you do? So TMVR and valve, usually you have a known valve. It doesn't mean the known is actually correct. So we recheck that with the CT image. And you can see here that they're similar, the fluoro that actually occurred and the CT. And then there's a valve and valve app. You should definitely download it. It's beautifully done. And you can find out what the in true internal diameter is. And that relates to the kind of prosthesis you put through it. And in this case, with a 31 millimeter valve, uh, an epic valve, which means you don't see the struts very well. The true ID is 27 millimeters, and by looking it up and looking at the area, and a number 29 sapien 3 would be a valve I'd put through that. And here we just recheck to be sure that the actual historical information is correct, and it was. Then you program in the virtual valve size. Now this is an important concept. By putting in a valve in the old valve, you displace the old anterior leaflet. And what you've done now is you cover up the open cells of the prior bioprosthetic valve, and you, by covering it, it becomes a stent graft. So now it's the area left over after the edge of where the old leaflet is that determines what the new left ventricular outflow tract is. And if you look at the bottom, what I used to do before I thought about this at all, is that we used to say, well, we'll just move the valve back and you'll be okay. But you can see that if you have an old leaflet and you have it distal touching the leaflet, or if you have it more proximal, the leaflet's still deployed up. So it's irrelevant, and this is an artifact of your own measurement. So you have to know what the actual length of the leaflet is that when you put the valve in valve. And here is the deployment of that. The CT image, now you're getting the angle for uh, a a deployment in the cath lab, and you can see you can barely see it on fluoro to the right, and you can see it better on CT, and that's how you achieve your angle. And then it's a 20 millimeter long stent strut. So you have to make the presumption, and the uh, person who implants it does make this presumption, that it's 20 millimeter long leaflet that might cause outflow obstruction. So that's where I measure my left ventricular outflow tract. In this case, it's quite small and had an increased likelihood of obstruction, but it didn't occur, fortunately. Now, what about TMVR in valve and MAC? The anchor of the valve is quite irregular, and it's not fully reliable. So these become important issues when you're thinking about, how do I place this safely? And in fact, when they took a large group of, of places that put this in and combined them together, there was a 20% malposition or embolization. This is over a historical period of time. It might be a little bit smaller now. There's a 9% LVOT obstruction, and these were in very high-risk non-surgical patients where MR is the predominant mitral valve lesion, even though they often have some MS. So here's an example of doing this. this we did this a while back. This is an elderly, small patient. Is there an adequate anchor? And what you like to see is about three-fourths of the circumference is covered in calcium so you can anchor your valve. That is the case here will they be left ventricular outflow tract obstruction? So in diastole, where it would be at its largest, I'm trying to find what valve do I put in. And here the area within the calcium is 3.71 centimeters squared. Then you do a device simulation on this software that you have available to you, and this is an old one. And so when we did the device simulation, it's a neo-LVOT, meaning the LVOT after I put in my virtual valve of 2.3 centimeters squared. And that's more than I expect, and expect this will not cause outflow obstruction. And then the patient came back who did have transient outflow obstruction, which improved with hydration. So what happened? Do we make the wrong measurement? So what we did was did a CT and looked at what the actual measurement is after the placement, and it was only 1.3 centimeters squared. But then I replanimetered this, excluding the anterior leaf of the mitral valve, and it was exactly what we predicted. So the hooker in this is that the anterior leaflet being displaced in valve and MAC is very hard to account for. So you want as big an area as you can in the left ventricular outflow tract. There is a new option now, as recently just published, where you lacerate or split this anterior leaflet, and by doing so, the stent graft-like effect that you have in the a uh, new valve gets somewhat eliminated by opening up the cells. And you can literally planimeter the open cell area. And so using this lampoon device gives you an option 
that we didn't have before. What about uh, if it's too large? Here, the area that we got was too large, and so my partner, who was a very clever guy, uh, decided we'd try a TMVR valve just made for that, where the anchor is different. And here the anchor is in the apex, not at the annulus. And this is putting a tendine valve in the MAC. And this is an ongoing trial, and it's been very successful. What about valve and ring? It depends on the ring. If the ring is, can be uh, transformed to be circularized, which can be in this particular ring, then you have the potential to eliminate that funny shape that would cause paravalvular leak. And here we can see what the area is, 440 centimeters squared, a millimeter squared, and here's the pre-valve and ring. And it's a very long anterior leaflet. Remember, I told you we're accounting for everything but that. Now, we know that it's long and a potential problem. We then put in what we think a number 26 valve should be, and we have a large neo-LVOT area afterward. After the procedure, we repeated the CT, and there was no LVOT obstruction, but you can see what the leaflet's doing. It's just fortunate for us. It didn't go back and obstruct the valve retrograde, and it didn't cause outflow obstruction from SAM. So these can be cases where you have more LVOT obstruction than you would expect, and if the ring is not circularized, you'll have more PBL than you expect. In general, this just came out, and it's fitting with what we've been doing, is that the LVOT should be at least 1.8 centimeters squared or greater, and that if it's less, it will account for a high sensitivity and specificity for a very bad problem, and that's outflow obstruction. Now, TMVR results, this is from 2009 to 2018, so they have a huge number of patients, but the results are skewed to the bad. But generally, what you see is outflow obstruction is much more common in valve and MAC than ring in valve and valve, and that moderate, at least, MR is more common in valve and ring and valve and MAC than valve and valve. So valve and valve really does work well. The other two, somewhat less so, and the mortality fits where valve and MAC is worse than valve and ring that is worse than valve and valve. Now, what about doing this when there's not a ring in there already? And so when you're trying to create uh, and understand the size to put a TMBR valve in, you want to go ahead and place seed points on your software going along the posterior mitral leaflet from the lateral to the medial trigone. Anatomically, it's a saddle shape, the mitral annulus. But in reality, when we're placing devices, we forget that and we actually draw a line between the two trigones, and that becomes a D shape. And this is the best way to size for TMVR. So we've had three different devices that we use for TMVR. This is the first one. It's an intrepid device, and it acts like a champagne cork-like mechanism. But it actually works. And the first report of the aggregate experience was that most were successfully delivered. These valves really eliminate mitral insufficiency, so that's a very important thing. And you do get a slight decrease in EF after its placement. When you go to analyze this, you have to make sure that the subvalvular apparatus is not very abnormal that would get in the way of placing the valve. And in the case on the left upper, that patient was screened out. Then when you want to go ahead and, and look at your annulus, here we've taken the whole view of the annulus. And this should be moving on the bottom. It's not. Uh, we're actually, with this valve, averaging systole and diastole to try to get what the neo-LVOT will be to decide about the valve size and whether we should place it. And then you'd go ahead and use what's called an STL file, which is the virtual uh, size of the valve, to see if the neo-LVOT will make it. Now, what Jonathan recently presented was that if we had done the old way that I described to you for the other techniques, you would have screened out so many patients, almost nobody would get this device. But for this particular device, we can use different ways of looking at the NEO-LVOT. So this is totally in process, and there'll be new information by next year and the year after. So right now, most of that's done by the company who's trying to screen for Intrepid. But as you know, HALT can occur in any of these bioprosthetic valves, and here's an example of that. Now, the tendine valve is one we use a fair amount and you have this STL file that you superimpose on your workstation if you have it available to you, and they're different sizes, and you look for the different NEO-LVOT. And here you see that the apex is where the valve is anchored, and that much less so than in the uh, annulus. And this is uh, very successful. It does require apical access, and you eliminate MR, but we screen out so many different patients for this TMVR. 
So what happens if you screen somebody out? They're desperate. They, there's nothing else they can do. So here's an example of one patient where we screened out. We're pre-alcohol ablation, and we just use this a Sapien 3 as an example so you can see differences in sizes, where it was a 2.4 centimeter squared NeoLVOT, and post-alcohol ablation on somebody who didn't have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the end NeoLVOT was markedly larger. So this is one approach to prepare people for something they can't otherwise have. Now, the caisson valve is the third one we've had available to us, and this has a mitral anchor. And this mitral anchor started to fail, uh, and so it's been redone. But one thing it does have, besides being a transeptal device, which is very good, let me try to play this again and stop playing. Sorry about that. It has an arm that actually captures the anterior mitral leaflet, so it prevents it from causing outflow obstruction. It's a very clever device. Now, what about the CT assessment? There's a million things one can look for, but it's very device dependent. And so we're not gonna talk about anything in particular, except for the things on the bottom, we've already talked about most of on top, where we look at the arterial and the venous access as well. So overall, for TMVR, CT is required. You need dedicated mitral software, and it's best if you have the STL file so you could simulate available devices. Currently, most is done in-house or in-company. Uh, or in a core lab for TMBR when you're using the native mitral valve. The best approach for each device evaluation is still in process, and there are many different devices, many more than I've shown you. And TMBR definitely relies on the proper use of cardiac CT. So thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Uh, anyone wants to ask a question to Dr. Lesser? talk. Um, could you talk about how you troubleshoot either potentially fracturing in valve and ring or valve and valve or even debridement for valve and MAC? Yeah, okay. I, I had a little trouble hearing you. How do you troubleshoot whether you should fracture the valve? Correct. Either okay. valve and valve or valve and ring or even debridement for valve and MAC. Right, right. Okay. Uh, well, for deciding whether to fracture the valve, it's something we do much more often in the aortic position. Uh, in the mitral position, what you would look at is what you expect to be the EOA after the new valve is placed. So if you had a very small mitral valve and you're placing a valve in valve, it's going to be smaller than that. And that's one where you would entertain the potential of fracturing the valve. You would put in the virtual valve and see what you're left over with. I mean, that's, that's one option. We don't fracture the mitral valve very often. I've only, I can think of two or three, okay. As far as do you debride the mitral annulus for mitral annular calcification, uh, there is an approach, instead of doing it uh, with a catheter, that you can literally go in and with a minimally invasive approach, try to go in and resect parts of the anterior leaflet. One option would be to use the lampoon device. So if you went ahead and did your CT and saw a small neo-LVOT, then you would know that by doing the lampoon, you had the potential to increase that size. You'd do a CT afterwards, and then literally preliminary the areas that would be open to see if the new LVOT makes it then. I hope I answered your question. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks so much, John. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. It's uh, Dr. Gianluca Pantone, who will speak to us on uh, CTFFR. Gianluca. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Patricia. OK, I have to just uh, summarize uh, in these uh, 10 minutes <clears throat> the role of, of FFRCT and which kind of uh, additional value this uh, tool has provided in the uh, field of cardiac CT uh, computer tomography. Uh, I believe that the FFRCT fits very well with the title of this uh, editorial that I published a couple of years ago uh, because uh, we know that the relationship uh, between anatomy and physiology in suspected coronary artery disease is a very complex uh, interaction. And uh, probably the CT with the, the tool of FFRCT provide a very robust explanation how this interaction uh, works in the um, uh, real world. 
just let me summarize the main topics regarding to the FFRCT. Any kind of new uh, tool needs to be accurate. And uh, several publications were provided in the last years regarding to the diagnostic accuracy of the FFRCT. And the last one was the NXT trial published in 2013 by Bjarne Nogard. In this uh, paper, the author demonstrated how the addition of the FFRCT on top of CT and geography is able to increase the diagnostic accuracy from 53% up to 81% thanks to, to the, the, the reduction of the false positive cases. And uh, thanks to this uh, improvement, the FFRCT has probably the best location in terms of uh, um, diagnostic accuracy because it provides the best compromise between sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosis of functional relevance of coronary artery disease. FFRCT is not only just accurate, but is also a reproducible technique. The process is partially manual, partially automatic, and if we read the same CT data set and we correlate the reading one versus reading two, as you can see, the Pearson correlation is extremely robust with the um, uh, index of 0 0.98, that if you compare this with any kind of human activity in the interpretation of any kind of a test, is extremely competitive reproducibility. This is important also to underline that uh, this uh, reproducibility is still robust even in some challenging settings such as patients with calcified lesion. Indeed, uh, if we correlate the invasive FFR with FFRCT in patients with low calcium score, the uh, correlation is good, 0.82, but even in the setting of a patient with high Agastan score, the correlation between invasive FFR and FFRCT still remain quite robust. In this uh, experience, is uh, 0.79. So it's a very great help when you have a calcified lesion in which you are not able to define the presence of obstructive or non-obstructive coronary artery disease. But the most uh, important uh, step forward is the demonstration of cost effectiveness of the uh, introduction of the FFR CT in patients with suspected coronary artery disease. And we did this uh, in the platform trial that was my first personal experience with the use of FFR CT in a clinical practice in which two different strategies, standard of care was compared versus FFRCT gatekeeper before invasive coronary angiography. And uh, uh, what we demonstrated in this paper in, um, on the European Art Journal was that thanks to the introduction of the FFRCT, there was a tremendous reduction of the patient, 83% in this case, with demonstration of uh, uh, flow-limiting coronary artery stenosis. As a result of this dramatically reduction, we were able to cancel in this experience 61% of the scheduled invasive coronary angiography, and among the patients in which the invasive coronary angiography was cancelled, no event occurred in a short-term follow-up and also in long-term follow-up. This is just a summary of what happened with standard of care. Usually you refer the patient to invasive coronary angiography, and the majority of patients patient has no obstructive coronary, coronary heart disease, and minority of patients receive revascularization. With FFRCT, you have a higher number of patients referred to medical therapy, and, the sm and a smaller number of patients referred to invasive coronary angiography, and this subset of the majority has an indication for revascularization. The uh, direct effect on the, uh, uh, is on the economical, on the cost of the strategy. Indeed, if you compare the standard of care blue line versus the FFRCT strategy, as you can see, thanks to the reduction of the number of the patients referred to invasive coronary angiography, you have a decrease of the cost ranging between 23% up to 26% at uh, three months and uh, after one year, uh, and one year after your decision. But more important, the FFRCT impact on clinical decision making and outcome. And the advanced trial is the largest registry at the moment published by using the FFRCT more than 5,000 patients, in which we demonstrated that when you do just a CT scan, the majority, half of these patients evaluated with the CT alone, 53%, and usually you need an additional test to take your decision. But if you um, perform FFRCT, sorry, FFRCT analysis, in 
in this uh, population, of course, uh, you don't need additional tests, and the majority of these patients are referred to medical therapy. This means that we have about 69 per 66 percent rate of reclassification when you introduce FFRCT on top of the CTA. And what happens when we take the decision based on the FFRCT? Uh, when you decide for medical therapy alone, this uh, uh, kind of uh, indication is uh, usually um, um, performed. Indeed, 95 percent indeed, 95 uh, percent of the patient indeed receive medical therapy. On the contrary, when you have a patient with indication, with the suggestion of revascularization, the majority of these patients are really revascularized, but you have there were about 30, 35 percent of the patient in which the indication of revascularization is not confirmed. And the additional point, very important, is that when you have a patient with obstructive coronary artery disease, an FFRCT more than 0.8, you don't have event at the three months of your evaluation, and this uh, prognostic impact is uh, still maintained at one year follow-up, as showed in a further paper, uh, again, of the advanced trial. But FFRCT is very robust also to predict even when you don't have obstructive coronary artery disease. And the Emerald One study showed indeed in a case control design in which the author compared patient who experienced the myocardial infarction versus patient in which there was no event and both of these patients have performed the CT angiography about two years before the event. They demonstrated and they calculated the um, adverse plaque characteristics of the patient and the adverse hemodynamic characteristics of the patient with FFRCT, and what they demonstrated was that the concomitant presence of both characteristics is associated with a very high risk to have uh, event myocardial infarction. This is just an example. This is a patient with the lesion on the LED. The patient had three characteristics to define the presence of iris plaque and three adverse hemodynamic characteristics. Indeed, after 116 days, the patient had myocardial infarction. On the other case, in the other case, you have no iris plaque. There were, there were no adverse hemodynamic characteristics. Indeed, the patient has still stenosis, but with no event associated. What about the use of FFRCT in the real clinical world? There is this very practical algorithm provided by an Orgard group uh, in which the author suggests uh, to scan the patient with the CT angiography. If you have iris canatome, I mean left main disease or proximal male ID, usually it makes sense to refer the patient directly to the cat. If you have low risk anatomy, usually nothing or optimal medical therapy can be suggested. But uh, in a very common situation of intermediate risk anatomy, you can scan the patient, you can uh, calculate FFRCT. If it is clear or positive, less than 0.75, you can go to the CAT lab. If it is more than 0.8, therapy, medical therapy. In the grade zone, of course, we need further classification of this patient. But we need to remember that there are, there are some limitations of the FFRCT. First of all, the positive predictive value of the FFRCT in an intermediate lesion. And this is a theoretical problem because this is the most challenging setting. But before to declare a false positive FFRCT, please remember that the reference is the invasive FFR because a normal angiogram does not mean a normal um, FFR. This is a typical example. Several classification on the LED. The FFRCT was positive. If you, if you refer the patient to the CAT lab and the lumen seems to be normal and you don't measure the invasive FFR, there is the risk to consider this a false positive FFRCT. But if you have time to measure the invasive FFR here again, you find it is a true positive case and not false positive. More important is to remember that the FFRCT correlated with stenosis for of, of course, but also with the ratio between the epicardial coronary volume and the left ventricle myocardial mass. In case you have a low ratio, usually you can have a pathologic FFR even in case of absence of coronary artery stenosis. And this is a physiological phenomenon. Just last me, last 20 seconds, FFRCT versus myocardial perfusion. The sub-analysis of the Pacific from Knapp, group of Paul Knappen showed how FFRCT is more powerful than PET and SPECT in this experience as compared to the invasive FFR, but this data was not confirmed. When you compare FFRCT with the perfusion, this is our experience with the CT perfusion, in which we found exactly the same diagnostic accuracy between FFRCT and static CTP. More important, let me just 
go to the last slide, is uh, to imagine that probably FFRCT and CTP are not competitive, but uh, they are complementary. And we demonstrate in this paper that uh, uh, a sequential strategy based on CT followed by FFRCT followed by the addition of a perfusion just in the grade zone with dynamic CTP is a powerful technique to improve the diagnostic accuracy. And I can stop here because there is no more time. Thank you. Thanks, Gianluca. Excellent presentation. Anyone wants to make a question to Dr. Montone? No? I would like to ask you a question. Uh, it's very interesting what you publish in, the, in this paper uh, showing the, the potential uh, adding of a perfusion in the cases where, uh, where FFRCT is not conclusive or is in the gray zone. How do you practice that uh, assistentially? Because I know that uh, FFRCT uh, is not available, the results immediately. Uh, of course, this, uh, in, the, in, the, in this population, uh, we uh, simulated different strategy because we had, in the same patient, both uh, value, both tools, FFRCT and dynamic. And then we combine, combined the, the, these two strategies to identify the best uh, strategy to detect ischemia. Uh, of course, actually, if you want to apply this uh, strategy in the real world, it's not feasible because you don't have real-time mm. FFRCT, mm. and so you have not uh, the value to decide if you need the addition of a perfusion on top, but everybody knows that probably in the next future, FFRCT number will be available in a very short time after the performance of a CT angiography, and in a um, theoretical scenario in which you scan the CT, in a few minutes you have the FFRCT and then you can decide this is enough to rule out, this is enough to rule in, this is an intermediate value, you can follow the CT angiography with the stress CTP. Great, thank you. Any other question? Well, we're, thank you very much. It was excellent, the presentation. We are going to move to the last uh, conference. It's going to be in charge of uh, Dr. James Min. Uh, the name is Artificial Intelligence for Risk. Dr. Min is professor of radiology at Will Corner Medical College, and it's director of Dalio Institute of Cardiovascular Imaging, and is past president of the SACT. Jim? All right, thanks so much. Um, so I'll, I'll try to keep this to 10 minutes. Um, so I, this was the talk I was, that was assigned to me. I, I didn't even know what it was uh, at the time. Like, so I'll, I'll try to do what I think the session organizers um, thought uh, was important. Here, here are my disclosures. Um, so you know, we hear about AI a lot, and we hear a lot about AI and imaging in particular. Um, here's a quote that's from uh, Vinod Kosla. He's a um, well-known venture capitalist. He was the founder of Sun Microsystems. And he made this very sort of controversial quote that he said, by 2025, 80% of the functions that doctors do will be done much better and much more cheaply by machines and machine-learned algorithms, right? And so I think that's sort of what the session organizers were referring to within the context of, of AI. And certainly the press has run with that. In the last couple of years, you've seen just this emergence of sort of lay press that pits the artificial intelligence against the doctor. And then even, you know, in, in lay press or sort of quasi-scientific um, places like the, uh, the MIT Technology Review, you can see that uh, what they are saying is that, you know, the, that, the, um, that the medical school should stop training radiologists now, right? And so the, the question is whether or not this is actually true or not. So that was a quote by Jeff Hinton, who's widely considered the godfather of deep learning, of, um, of machine learning. So I think that you know, the, the, the thing it, that machine learning does and AI does is sort of the same thing that we have done traditionally over the last 30, 40 years, right? There's nothing different um, about machine learning in terms of its goals, right? So when we try to get to something about risk of a patient, we typically have used multivariable logistic regression models, right? So standard statistical models. And you know, I, I went to college at the University of Chicago, and when I came to the first test um, in my basic 101 physics test, it was, uh, it was an essay test. It was an open book essay test. And I thought, this is supposed to be basic physics 101. And what the, the reason it was an essay test was because at the University of Chicago, they said, you know, if you're going to come at a problem, come at it with a hypothesis, right? So every question was design an experiment that would prove out X, Y, Z. And that's how we approach research, right? We always approach it with a hypothesis. And then we try to prove whether or not that hypothesis is right or wrong. 
In contrast, what machine learning will do, particularly these, these deep learning methods, is it'll just amass a, a tremendous amount and troves and troves of data. And I'll say, look, I don't have a hypothesis, but I'm going to say, you know, that person died and that person didn't, so let me use the data to figure out empirically why uh, that person is associated with death versus no death. And so I think while the goals are the same, the approaches are completely uh, different. The other thing is that this whole deep learning thing, you know, it's, it's not really a thinking machine, but it's just these empirical models that are based upon large amounts of data. Um, but the claim is that these deep learning algorithms can continue to improve with the addition of more data uh, without a hypothetical plateau, right? So that therein, I think, would, would help a lot. And so you see a lot of these kinds of figures where you see these, this is just a representation of an image-based convolutional neural network. Um, it's not so important like, you know, what, what its framework is, as it is that like sort of this whole area um, where they perform the machine learning um, can be used with an input here and, oops, and then an outcome of something, right? Is the calcium score high or not high? Or is the patient going to have a heart attack or not have a heart attack? And so then the question I think that arises and is pertinent to this lecture is can machine learning improve risk prediction from uh, CT and geography? So I think the first thing that you'll see when you look, there's probably a couple hundred of these AI machine learning companies out there trying to do this, and there's hundreds and hundreds of academic groups trying to do this on medical imaging. And I think what, what you will see over the course of the next decade is that what we do on a daily basis will be gone, right? Like the way we interpret an image will be done automatically. The way we interpret a perfusion scan will be done automatically. And I think just to show this sort of point that the machine is already superhuman in terms of recognizing features that we routinely miss. Um, I put up this video, it's the YOLO is called You Only Look Once, it's, a, it's an algorithm that trained um, a machine to recognize people. So if you think about it from this standpoint, um, let's see if it plays. So this is an algorithm that recognizes people. I think that it, it's based on a James Bond movie, but what you can see is that in real time that this algorithm can see things that we would never be able to detect in, in that same sort of accuracy and that same sort of efficiency. So I think what you're gonna see are just these tremendous number of like quote unquote innovations where they apply machine learning to either a lung nodule detection on a CT scan or you know a hemorrhage on a brain MRI or something like that. And then that will be sort of the first foray of where we see machine learning applied to CT. And when you look at a CT scan and you start to break it down from a macroscopic all the way down to a microscopic view, you know, we can look at these volume rendered views and then we can do MPRs and look at the coronaries. Then we can start to look at cross-section, look at all these kinds of plaques. And then you can even get into these grayscale areas where you just get voxel, gray level voxel information, right? And that's that whole idea of radiomics and using deep learning based radiomics. So when you take a step back and say, well, what are we trying to ask and answer with a CT scan? I think these are some of the pertinent questions that have been touched upon in this session. And those are things, actually, when you look at it, the quantification of atherosclerosis, or is the stenosis greater than 70%, who's gonna have a heart attack, does this patient have ischemia, et cetera, et cetera. Those are things that machines tend to be particularly good at, right? So, you know, in that you only look once algorithm, machines are particularly good at segmentation, right? If you give it enough training data, they're very good at classifying things, at clustering things, they're good at regression, at making associations between who's sick, who's not sick, and all of these kinds of things. So I think what you're going to see is the application of machine learning in terms of risk prediction. But in order to understand the risk prediction and train the machine, I think we have to first understand the pathophysiology ourselves. So this one, I think you give kudos to a large group of centers, 13 sites in eight countries, and really give kudos to Hyuk Jae Chang from Korea. So for about five years, he had a core lab that looked at 234 patients who experienced myocardial infarction out of an entire overall group of 25,000 patients. So these were all stable patients at the time of CT, and they subsequently experienced acute coronary syndrome af sometime after the CT. Then he matched them one-to-one -to, -one to controls to people who underwent a CT scan and did not experience an acute coronary syndrome. And he matched them for age and gender, for site and country, for coronary disease risk factors, and most importantly, for angiographic coronary artery disease extent and, and severity. 
And the first question that he said was, you know, why are we trying to look at the stenosis? We know from Ambrose and all of the other studies that were quoted in the 1990s that, you know, stenosis didn't seem to be associated with, um, with future MI risk in the way that non-obstructive lesions did. So the first thing he did was repeat what Ambrose did, and he turned out, he found out exactly the same thing that Ambrose did, which is that the majority of lesions that you see on a CT scan that will cause heart attacks are not uh, greater than 50% stenosis. So then he said, well, maybe it's the plaque, it's not the patient, and it turns out there it's even worse, right? Like only 4% of the lesions that you see on a, on a CT scan that are greater than 70% will be the cause of a culprit in the future. More than three-fourths of the scans of the culprit lesions that cause MI are less than 50%. Um, percent. So then at this point in time, the hypothesis it was that it must all be about atherosclerosis, right? Which it was not. Right? When you looked at the total plaque volume between the patients who experienced ACS versus those who did not, they did not differ at all by total atheroma volume, they didn't differ by calcified plaque volume, and they didn't differ by fibrous plaque volume. Instead, the only differences that you saw between the cases and the controls of those patients who would experience acute myocardial infarction after a CT is in this whole fibro fatty and the necrotic core um, plaque composition. And then it goes back, it, it reverts the other way too. So if you flip the other side of the coin, Alexander Van Rosendahl is sitting here in the audience. He's from Jerome Bax's lab and has done a number of, a, a lot of work on this iconic uh, database. And what he said was, look, we always say that calcium is this white calcium, but maybe not all calcium is calcium is calcium. So he looked at the Hounsfield unit densities of all of these calcium and identified a cut point that he called 1K plaque. That's the Hounsfield unit densities greater than 1,000, which he said, well, maybe what happens is this calcium gets denser and denser and denser over time, and hence brighter and brighter with higher Hounsfield units. So what he found here, and I'll just point to the right side here, is that if you, the more 1K plaque that you have, the brighter calcium, the more protective it is against that lesion um, being a future culprit in um, future myocardial infarction. And conversely, on the left side, what you can see is that the more necrotic core, that low attenuation plaque that you have, the higher the risk that that plaque will cause an acute coronary syndrome in the future. And so um, here's just an example of a patient within Iconic. So I think we're now getting to the point where we're able to look at these kinds of coronary arteries. And what I can show you is that this person has a tremendous amount of atheroma, right, all through this. And you see one here and here and here and here and all throughout the entire artery, it's speckled with atheroma. But in Iconic, these kinds of plaques that you see there caused acute coronary syndromes and were the culprit lesions 0% of the time. So anytime you saw a purely calcified, highly dense plaque, it never caused acute coronary syndrome. In contrast, it was these lesions here. This lesion here over on the left does not appear to be highly obstructive, and yet it has a high atheroma burden with low attenuation plaque, this necrotic core, and that's the kind of person who comes back 44 days later with a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. So how does this um, relate to machine learning and risk and things like that? Well, I think we're just starting to learn this. So based on this multi-site confirmed registry of about 23,000 patients who underwent CT, um, Alexander also looked at the performance of an ensemble boosting machine learning algorithm to say, you know what, maybe we can't figure it all out on our own. Like we can't figure out a greater than or less than 70% stenosis and 30 millimeters of low attenuation plaque and it's, hey, it's 4.2 centimeters away from the Osteum, and it's at a bifurcation. So he said, look, let's put all of these variables inside uh, the algorithm, and then let's see whether or not these 35 variables um, can predict who's going to have um, a MACE event and who's not. And what you can see here on the left side are the areas under the, oop, the, areas under the curve, and you can see that the, the machine learning model out predicts the standard ways that we do it, right? Duke prognostic index, segment stenosis score, segment involvement score. And over on the right, what you see are the relative feature importance that contribute to that machine learning algorithm. And you see that it sort of pathologic, pathophysiologically makes sense, right? It's prox LAD severity, left main severity. All of this in confirm was just based on semi-quantitative sort of eyeball reads. So when we couple it with quantitative measures, I think we're going to see increased precision. And so this is another boosting algorithm, machine learning method, that looked at the iconic data on, on a 
per slice data, looking at all the richness that comes out of it in order to try to predict who's going to have a heart attack and, and who's not. So where, where are we going next? I think that there's obviously a need for machine learning if we're going to do risk prediction. So Hyukje's lab, when he did all of those analyses, um, it took about six to eight hours per patient for his core lab to get through a single scan. Um, that's on the research setting. On the clinical setting, if you think about if we had done retrospective ECG gating on 20 scans and that's the clinical reads we're responsible for a day, that's about 3.2 billion pixels and there's no way that anybody can tell me that a machine can't do that better than, than, than we can. So I think that we're going to see machine learning, how it's going to integrate into daily practice. I think what you're going to see is automated assessment and characterization of all the stuff that we find in the scan. We'll see prognostication based upon data that we learn in these large-scale multi-site registries. I think where machine learning is going to be the most powerful is to link multiple dimensions of data and integrate it into a single solution. So what you see is just a picture from the internet, but it's a radio genomics solution. So linking radiomics with genomics, with clinical data, with serum biomarkers, et cetera, et cetera. It's that multi-dimensionality. And then I think it'll probably give us real-time guidance as to, you know, how should we act upon these findings in a way to improve event-free survival. Uh, thank you very much. Question to Dr. Shim. Okay, great. Um, so I, I think this, uh, thank you all for coming. This session is adjourned. <laughs>